Okay, so I'm James, K6JLM. some other show and tell for amateur right here. Um, so why would I choose to do this? Well, Maddie, who's not here, uh, was talking about this device on the list, and then I kind of procrastinated and said, oh, well, that's just another device. But I actually got one. They're really cheap, or they were. I don't know if you can still buy them. Um, you can. Uh, I, I checked this week. It was oh, Office Depot's done. I don't know. I don't know how much Office Depot's like. They're on, they're on <coughs> Amazon. They're on line. Okay, at some point, they were $30. They're not that cheap. Okay. Maybe, maybe at Christmas or maybe at some other time. Okay. And compared to some other devices, like if you've seen any of these embedded PCs like Socris engineering boards or, you know, which are like 3 6 boards, these things have more memory than, you know, those things. And they were like $150 and bigger. Um, and low power. I mean, you can. Put this somewhere that you don't care that it's on 24/7. And these devices, I think, are based on the uh, uh, forget the name of the company, but the people that put out the Shiva plug. Um, are you guys familiar with that? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, fir the, the first plug computer. Um, okay. Pretty sure this is exactly the same thing, with a different uh, little code indicating the device ID. Um, I can't remember the name of the company. So it's intended to be used as a NAS, and Box shows the two hard drives in there. And there's USB on the back. So it's basically the USB, Ethernet, and power. And you can look at it later. And other people have done projects with, not necessarily like the GoFlex, but with Shiva plugs or other plug computers. Um, Asterisk server, of course, you can't directly connect a uh, phone to the plug computer, they use a uh, uh, SIP devices that talk over the network to their uh, plug computer, but it, they run the asterisk server on the plug. Um, small web server, you know, keeping notes or, you know, images, photo gallery, um, or maybe you want to just use it as a network storage device anyways and just have better control and you can run cron jobs and parse and whatever. So this is what I was working on. Um, so I had some old amateur radio gear, an old uh, terminal mode controller, we'll talk about that, and an old uh, radio, two meter. Um, gathering dust, just sitting somewhere in a box, and I experimented with a uh, packet radio, which I'll talk about in a second, for a while. And I wanted to do something with it, since I have this device. And I wanted to put up an amateur radio antenna, but not anywhere in my house where I could drill holes. So I just put it in the garage, and I put it, you know, in the corner of the garage. I don't care if it gets stolen or, it, you know, something falls on it or it's if it's you know, on 24/7. Um, and I also will talk about later about kind of routing the digital the packets from the radio to, say, my desktop in my room. And so what I ended up doing was setting up an APRS to repeater, which I will now try to explain. So APRS is Amateur Radio, Amateur Positioning Radio System or something like that. Amateur Packet Reporting System. And basically it's a type of digital communication using audio frequency shift keying is the way the uh, data is modulated. And that basically just means there's an audio signal that creates the digital packets. So it's basically a modem, but over the uh, airwaves. Um, so there just happens to be that over, since the past 30 years, since this technology came out in the 80s, so it's not anything new, nothing groundbreaking. Um, people put up what are known as digipeters. Basically, they hear a packet and they just repeat it. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, I might be in my car and I'm doing what most people do with APRS is send out a position report. So I have a little device in my car that reads the uh, GPS information from a GPS, converts it to the packet, and sends it to a radio. And I'm not going to be able to have everybody in LA hear me just from my car. So people put up uh, digipeters on mountaintops or high hills or in 
the house to, to repeat the signal. And then at some point, uh, the internet became bigger because uh, when the APRs first started, I don't think the internet was really widespread. And it was mostly the digipeters doing the work. Um, people decided to put up what is known as iGates. Um, basically, it's a set of servers that when you connect to it, you can send it information from the RF world, the radio frequency world, and it gets repeated to all the other connected servers and all the other connected clients. So a lot of these digipeters now are eye gates. So if you broadcast from your radio while you're driving, or maybe like this device here, I can actually walk, walk around. It has a GPS built in and it can send out position reports. And it will eventually make its way to the internet. And I can show you how that looks with some of the web interfaces people come up for visualizing this. And so as I said here, packets are mostly position reports. Packet radio, you can actually do more. It kind of is, uh, APRs is using an unconnected format, which is kind of like UDP uh, equivalent. But you can actually do connected traffic with packet radio, but nobody does it anymore. And oh, you can also send short messages, which some people do. Um, but actually, I've actually seen spam that people send over the internet. It, uh, APRS world, that if you're not careful when you're trying to gate stuff from the internet world to the RF world, you might unintentionally be putting out spam um, to the RF world. Um, so the nodes uh, can be digipeters, or it could be your device, or it could be uh, something that you, you could put up a scanner that just listens and translates it through your sound card in the packets. and that would be called a receive-only iGate. And you might want to do that if you're putting these, if you want to listen for packets in areas that are not covered by other nodes. Um, so as I say, it's basically, it goes back to 1980. Some guy made basically a radio mode. Um, so this is kind of what happens when stuff eventually gets to the internet from the RF world. Or you could broadcast over the, R the internet world and so this is kind of centered around where I live. But there are a bunch of, you can see here, people send out uh, weather reports, actually. So one of the fun things people like to do is they get one of these Peak Brothers weather stations that has like a uh, the wind sensor and the temperature sensor and the humidity sensor, and then they connect it to a device or a computer and then send out reports over to RF or to the internet. And I guess they might also send it to you know, the weather service, the amateur, you know, there's amateur weather people, and I think the weather service allows you to send them information. Um, and then, I think right here you can see there's actually a guy walking, at least according to his icon. He was just walking around in some kind of position. So if you use Google Latitude, very similar, except this is all public. When you, because of the way amateur radio works, there can be no encrypted communication over the amateur uh, radio airwaves. Uh, therefore, anybody can listen in to what you're saying. Uh, so anybody can hear your packet. Um, so the internet world kind of works the same way. Anybody can see your position report. So certainly if you're worried about people knowing where you are, you put in some uh, uncertainty into your packet. Uh, remove some of the digits in your latitude and longitude so they can't kind of tie down exactly where you are. Um, and I guess you can see guys driving somewhere. And there's, this one actually has a track where it's been tracking the guy for a while. So, and the raw packets. It's basically just a screen dump from when I was looking at the packets. Um, there's a special way that APRS, APRS uh, positions are reported, which is kind of funky because I think this character in between the latitude and longitude is actually part of the icon, and so is this. So it's a really ad hoc format that kind of evolved and was appended to, and with the limitations of how much space they have. So to give you an idea of how fast packet radio stuff is, it's 1200 BPS. It's 1.2 kilobits per second. Um, a Zigbee can be faster than that. Um, but part of the Part of that is because the two meter band, where a lot of this activity is going on, at least for APRS, doesn't have a lot of bandwidth for people to tie up. Uh, amateur radio stuff could get a lot faster if you move to higher uh, frequencies, which have more bandwidth. And if you use 
microwave. You could probably send faster. Than, you could set up links faster than some internet links. So what did I do? Okay, now this is this diagram is probably from the 80s. I bet somebody uh, drew this on a DOS computer. Back in the PC pen or something, which I thought was nice. Um, so basically, my computer talks to a TNC terminal node controller, which all it does is it translates the uh, serial data that I'm sending it into audio. So it's a motor. And it obviously tells the radio that push to talk means that's the button that if you're at the radio, you push it and you say, I'm going to start talking. So it keys the radio to start transmitting and sends the audio and it also listens. And you're usually talking to this over serial connection. So this is the old hardware that I had. The Timeway PK232 is a pretty old device. Uh, I looked it up, designed in 1985, and they still sell it. Um, they've, append they've added to it, and I actually saw an ad, I should have brought it, and said, the legendary PK232 uh, is still, you know, still going. Now you can do all these other features because they have daughter boards that you can plug into it to do other things. And they've actually made it a little bit more modern where it actually has a USB uh, sound card built in. So you would only have to plug it in in the USB and not have to have like a serial card. Um, so I bought this off eBay. It's actually kind of broken. I had to replace parts of it. And this TR7950 is the radio. It's a two meter radio. Uh, mid 80s, two, two uh, meter is the uh, frequency range, which is about 144 megahertz. If you're not savvy on those uh, uh, wavelength descriptions, and an antenna that I just put on top of my garage, and oh, I just put in something to say the way my antenna is leaning, I'm a little biased towards the east because it's kind of not on the top of the roof. It's kind of facing eastward. And the GoFlex, where this is a bigger picture, you can see that it has USB, Ethernet, and power. And, oh yeah, Marvell, that's the uh, plug for feeding people. So it's basically like a Shiva plug, but in this form factor and made for Seagate. 128 megs of RAM, I think that's a lot. Especially for these devices, and I'd argue that's a lot even for the VPS that you set up on the internet. You can do a lot for 128. Um, and as Giggy. So also, I needed something else. This is a, something else that we had. This is the Bonera that I got back when they were giving them away for free. And I just use it as a Wi-Fi client. And then I set this all up in my garage. The uh, terminal node control. Yes, this is very good. So this is the this is the GoFlex. So this is modern manufacturing SMT technology at work. Plastic, you know, this is made of plastic. This is metal, and this is all uh, through hole uh, components inside the board. And I think this is also all through hole too. Um, and you can see I'm tuned to the APRS channel. And I have a uh, watch. ASWR meter, so I can see it. I'm actually getting too much signal reflected back on my antenna. Basically, I'm just trying to make sure the antenna is working right, and then I did set it wrong. So, one other piece of hardware you would, might need if you want to hack this. So, I'm going to kind of go into more of the next stuff. Is if you pop this open, there's actually a serial port inside, and it's not the 5 volt logic that you usually use on a computer, but 3.3 TTL logic. But you can easily create an adapter from these Nokia, um, char not charges, uh, just Nokia data cables that the model that is listed here, if you ever get into this. And you just basically hook it to the right pins, and you have a USB serial device can also speaks TTL 3.3 volt logic. And in my case, uh, to get it to connect to the pens on the GoFlex, I kind of just cut up an old CD audio cable that I had.
but you could probably also use, um, you know, those little jumpers you have on your mo motherboard uh, for connecting like the speaker, the reset button, and all that. You could use those too. So the first thing you want to do when you want to get into the GoFlex is get SSH access so you can get into it and modify it. So this website here, you can get links later, um, is the Pogo plug interface. So the, the, the way these come is that factory install is something called Pogo plug links, where you can't actually access the device directly, but you go to their, the Pogo plug website, which talks to your device. And through that, you control it. So there's no web server running on this, I believe. Maybe there's some other server that contacts the Pogo plug people, and then it you know, comes, talks back through that network connection. Um, so what you want to look for, I don't know why that's circle in that picture, but anyone else. You want to look for this, enable SSH. So in my case, I didn't see that when I first logged in. And it turns out it was a firewall issue. I had to do it. I luckily found this forum post where somebody said um, 4 through UDP 4365 there. And it'll show up. So before that, that box wasn't even there. And I was started inspecting the uh, HTML to see if they could move it if people were hacking or something. But apparently it was just a firewall issue. So once you get SSH access, you want to be able to boot the uh, Linux of your choice. So what you have to first do is put in a different bootloader because the uh, bootloader that's on here will not do anything but from the flash and I'm pretty sure it checks to make sure it's the last version of the install. But this name, Jeff Duzen, you'll do a lot. He did a lot of scripting work to make doing these things easier. And they do have U-Boot on here, which is the bootloader that these devices use, but it's their version of U-Boot that they've removed stuff. But Jeff compiled or modified or patched the uh, standard U-Boot, which is open source, for the uh, GoFlex. And one of the nice features is that it has a setting where you can change the code number, which is a code that it sends to the kernel saying, this is what type of device I am. So you can spoof that or masquerade that or whatever you want to call it. So you can boot Shiva plug uh, Linux kernels. And you can see the installation process here. That's all you have to do. Once you have SSH access, you just log, you just go to a directory where you can have write access. W get the script and run it. And uh, if you want to debug, so if you run into problems like I did while you're doing all this, there are two things that you should have on the have in your mind. You need to use a net console, which basically just sends uh, a connection, uh, what's happening as the bootloader comes up. And Jeff's uh, U-Boot has that. But make sure you set it up before you reboot after installing the new U-Boot, or else you might have to end up buying a serial cable anyway, so you won't have any idea why it's not booting this. You're not going to see anything. This is all you have. But a serial cable is recommended, and it's kind of fun if you just want to like solder things together. And you can actually watch the entire process as it comes through. And you don't need a network connection for the serial cable. Uh, the net console stops at the bootloader. You don't see the kernel boot up, so you can't see any of the kernel messages. So, oh, mdeb. So mDebian is a stripped down version of Debian. Um, I think mostly what they've done is they just put the uh, Shiva plug kernel with a small set of packages. So if you do apt update or uh, apt get update, um, they, they've intentionally kept the number of packages small because in the standard Debian, just the uh, listing of what packages are available can be, can be quite big. So to keep you from running out of space on these type of embedded devices, there's only a small set. But you can use any of the ARM uh, Debian packages from the main ARM Debian. You just have to download it separately and have to install it manually. Um, let's see. So to do this, oh, to be able to install the mDebian, you have to be able to boot from something that's not a USB stick or USB device because this, the scripts that Jeff wrote has, part of the process is that it writes to the USB stick or hard drive you've attached before it installs it into memory. 
but eventually you can uh, install mdebian into uh, the flash and you can boot it without anything attached to it. And that's why I, I, I don't have any, I use the USB as a, with a USB to serial the top to my uh, image rated view. And there's probably some tweaking you have to do where if you want to make everything, if you want to make it a read-only uh, Linux install so that you're not taxing the man flash too much, you might need to move things to the uh, RAM disk or else things won't work, such as uh, DHCP won't work and you won't be able to get an IP address. Um, and he also has a rescue system, which is a real, even smaller uh, thing that can also be installed alongside MDebian and Man Flesh. And his, his bootloader will allow you to kind of, has a procedure for selecting which one it boots into. So if it can't boot into MDebian or from the USB drive, it'll go through this recovery system, which is intended to allow you, if you screwed up something, on one of the other installs to be able to SSH in and change things. And one of the problems I had, I couldn't find anybody else that had this problem, was I couldn't get the uh, rescue install to actually load the kernel. And apparently, I guess I had one, some blocks of memory in the RAM that are bad. So the way it loaded, it lo the, the bootloader loads the uh, kernel in the memory, and then it runs the kernel. So mine would stall while it was loading the kernel into memory and would never start it. But moving the offset um, where it loaded the kernel to memory just slightly, and it worked. <laughs> so that's things that can frustrate you. Uh, that's when the sharks will start playing. You think it was just bad from the factory? I don't know. I haven't tried it on a second one. Uh, I think this is not typical because I haven't seen anybody actually saying you know, this is what my bootloader showed as it was loading and I stopped here. So the bootloader would actually just put a little star saying I'm loading, loading in the memory. And it would stop. Other people would stop at different points for different reasons. So they would, other people would actually get to the point where the kernel started booting, but maybe they had the arc number wrong. And it said, oh, I'm not actually loading from like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I just changed the offset, which they look like magic numbers. But when you realize what they're doing, they're basically just saying, here's where to load the kernel in there. So now that I had MDebian uh, set up and I had Linux and I actually had something I could SSH into, I set up the APRS stuff. And for doing APRS or packet radio for Linux, you really just need the kernel drivers for uh, AX25, which is the protocol, the name of the protocol that Amateur Radio Packet Radio uses. And I set up a program that's a digipeter, and it's APRX. I think it's a, some Dutch people wrote it. It's just a small C program. It doesn't depend on anything else. I can say that next slide. And it allows me to do these features, I gate. So when I listen, I hear a packet over the RF world, I can send it to the internet. And I can also digipeat. So if I hear a packet over RF, I can repeat it over RF. And I can also drop packets from the internet to the RF world. And I found that that can be dangerous because the internet stream of APRS data needs to be validated before you put your FCC license in jeopardy by pushing it out. Um, let's see. So it's really configurable. It has an XML-like config file. Um, can speak to a terminal mode controller in various ways through term through a serial connection directly or through the AX25, which is kernel kernel mode stuff. And it has a feature that doesn't exist in the other digipeters, which is viscous digipeter. Which most digipeters that if you watch the uh, packet radio tra traffic, they repeat anything they hear. So it's and this is a simplex. Uh, system where everybody is sending out their signal on the same instead of other instead of uh, like an amateur radio voice repeater usually works for this endpoint input frequency and output frequency but not for this packet radio stuff so there could be people clobbering each other as they're sending out their packets so they, these guys came up with uh, the idea why don't you just store the packet and wait and see if anybody else repeated it and then repeat it which 
they have charts showing it really dramatically cuts down the number of transmissions and could improve the uh, Erlang, I guess is the, is the measure of the uh, channel. And there's another package that if you look at an air for these type of projects, somebody uh, set up a digifeeder with uh, one of these uh, these routers, the uh, w, what is it? WGST 54 or whatever. WRT, yeah. one of those. And they use something called APRS 4R, which is a German program, but it's a Ruby program, and that's not bad in itself, but then when you try to install it, and you're installing it on MDebian, which doesn't have all the packages, so you can't just have dependency fulfillment automatically because you know MDebian's sort repository itself don't have it. And then you try to start manually inputting those, you see it has a lot of dependencies. And when I loaded it up, on, when I did get it loaded up, half the interface was in German and half in English, so I guess they have translated everything. And I think, you know, web interface for what I was doing is overdue. I just want to, you know, put a console and change the stuff that way. Um, so I also did remote packet access. I don't know. So the radio is out in the garage. I don't want to have to go out there all the time. I, if I wanted to send packet data from my desktop, what I do. Um, it's all basically serial type of stuff. So I basically just routed the serial data through a network connection and then turned it back into an AX25 uh, looking device that the Linux software can talk to. And you can run programs like XXSD, I guess that's how you call it, which is the Linux mapping program. Uh, for APRS, and I actually have it running here. And I'm not using RF because I tried listening for packets with my radio here, but this room, you can't hear anything. So I'm connected to the internet. And, okay. So, and unfortunately I just clicked, and it's, this thing doesn't have fast maps. Um, this is a pretty old program. It started off reading Tiger Maps. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. Um, and it also loads Terra Server Maps. Wow. So you, you could, uh, but right now it's like OpenStreetMaps. So we had somebody here that presented OpenStreetMaps a while ago. So he, he might be proud of that. I don't know who that was. Um, but all these icons are people that have reported positions and gotten them through the internet. Um, maybe they've gone through the URL, or maybe not. Probably the cars did go through the RF form, but maybe the houses did not. And so there's a lot of traffic in LA of people flying around with this. And is there a hit count every day? Is there a count every day? Excuse me? Is there like a hit count every day? Hit count. Uh, how long frequently are people updating? Um, well, I can show you in a second the APRS FI website again where you can kind of see some of that. Uh, like, here's some statistics that you can get from that website. So this uh, map shows packets that I've heard directly. So it kind of can give you a propagation map, sort of, of, your, of what your radio can hear. I say sort of because since there's so many people clobbering each other on the, this frequency, that there might be some weak signals you can hear but you can't because somebody, you know, uh, send their signal out on top of that. So I, there are people in the amateur radio world that have beacons set up for doing uh, long distance communication and when the bands open, which means when the atmospheric conditions are such that you can actually communicate on that frequency, you'll start hearing these beacons. But I don't think you can do something equivalent of fake RS for the fact that the bands are not quiet most of the time. It's, it's a really crowded. RF world. And so this APRX program also sends out telemetry, which you can send out through the RF world or you can just send it to the internet. So I just send my telemetry to the internet. And this is kind of how many packets I've received per 20 minutes, how many I've transmitted, so I guess that's at the bottom. And in the middle is how many the uh, I gate drops, which means I, I report a packet to the IJ, has it heard it before? If, it has, if it's heard it before, it'll reject it. Or it might reject it because it thinks it's 
Um, okay, this is nice. Maybe nice. move that sort of thing. Oh, great. Sorry about that. Well, in conclusion, this is a small device that you can set up things like this. <laughs> um, it's not going to use a lot of power. I haven't, I haven't put a watt meter on it, the uh, kilowatt device. I haven't actually connected one of those to it, so I don't know actually how much power it uh, uses. So, don't, so I could be wrong. It could be very power hungry. What's the rating on the wall work for the, for the GoFlex? I didn't bring it with me because I, I didn't know. I'm going to pull some weight out, but uh, I don't know, I think it's not an amp. I'll pull that up and see what it says. It's probably 500 milliamps or something like that. Okay. I don't know. It, it's a small one. It's not a huge one. Um, if I could get rid of that little thing. Okay. So I have Acres FI loaded here. It's live. And there are different things you can look at. Uh, maybe I want to look at this guy. So let's look at some info on this thing. So it's 0.65 uh, amps max. Okay. So that's, that's probably it has a couple of hard drives in it. Well, mine, I don't have any hard drives. Right, so it's probably fresh. Oh, okay, I see. And if you, and if you don't have a hard drive or a USB stick, Maybe it's less than me. So I don't know. This guy, this guy's sent a lot of positions, so he's he's been on here a while. Uh, you can use this for your own endeavors. I mean, let's look at me. So a while ago, okay, that was. So it stores, I don't know how long, but each of these is the time that I actually had this device here actually get heard by some other device and route to the internet. And all of this has a meaning. Somewhere in here it tells you who heard you. And this is kind of a uh, impressed version of the latitude uh, longitude. And I don't know if it'll show like static packages. Where is the static package? Yeah, like maybe you do something like this for yourself and watch yourself drive to work and come back. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so so there are other devices uh, Maybe I should bring up that website. Like, Bionics is a company that sells some neat little kits you can buy. Uh, this one here, Microtrack, ready to go, RTG. So it comes with everything you need to set up a APRS position reporting uh, system in your car. It's, it's a, in, I wouldn't say embedded, it's like a it's like an Amtel chip or it's not an Amtel, but it's some pick based device and it has a built in radio and you connect it to this GPS and plug it in a cigarette lighter and you're sending packets to the internet and you're not paying for a data plan on your uh, phone to use Google Latitude. I guess that's the only reason I could give for not using Google Latitude and using this instead. Um, but I guess most mostly people do this because it's hardware hacking or they find it interesting. Why do I find it interesting? No reason. <laughs> I, I, I like the, uh, as far as amateur radio goes, there's different facets of it, of course. Um, there are people that just like to talk to each other. They're called rag chewers. Um, there are people that like to send Morse code. Um, and then rack you over more code instead of over voice. There are people that like to build uh, microwave antennas, which if you've you ever looked at some of the microwave antennas, you wonder how it actually works, because they're just waveguides at that point, and you're just getting sheet metal and 
constructing it at the right uh, weight uh, sizes for the wavelength in question. And if you've ever looked at a microwave amplifier, it kind of looks like magic because it's these traces of copper, you know, <laughs> it's in all the devices. Um, so I kind of just like hardware stuff with amateur radio. If you build kits, you build like building kits. These guys will sell you. This one doesn't come in a kit form, but I think this one does. Oh, not that. This one doesn't come in a kit form. So you can build two whole kits, no SMT uh, for that. But you can buy the pre made one, which is, has all surface mount components. But most people don't like soldering surface mount devices unless you have like a reflow cabinet or something. There, there, there are ways to do it, and there, I, if you look at Make Magazine or any of those, there's different techniques people come up with for doing SMT, so I, I don't want to do that. Um, but you can put this together yourself. Uh, you save a couple bucks, you know, the kit is 65, the build is 75. So you're not saving anything really, but you're putting it together yourself. Uh, but you're having a little bit of fun. If that's what you're interested in. Um, there are other digital modes for amateur radio other than APRS, so don't let this throw you off at 1200 baht. Yeah. There are some people that do uh, something called meteor scatter, where they actually send digital stuff off of, say, the moon or, or meteor scatter. And there's, it's kind of like a type of Morse code that's really long in length, so a dot would be like, you know, tens of seconds long and a dash would be tens of seconds long and averaging the signals you hear, you can pick up, you know, long distance communication over really bad conditions such as, you know, off the moon. Somebody's actually done it. Uh, US to UK up from there. Uh, You're not talking uh, EVE either. Yeah, that is easy for you. No, EME e e is e moves. EME, e yeah, that's EME, Earth, Moon, but, Earth. But people have done EVE, too. Oh, Venus. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. they, they, they cheated. They used a 30-foot dish. Yeah, okay. That was a, that was a <laughs> presentation at the, uh, MP, the, the Pasadena Radio Club. Yeah, they had a, a really big dish to do that. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, maybe I could just tell you about this device. It's a Kenwood. Uh, what is this one? I don't think you care, but it's a 72A, TM72A, released in December. It has APRS built in, has a GPS built in. Uh, you can also connect it to your computer and use it like a terminal mode controller. It's pretty big to beat somebody with it. Uh, dual band. Dual band. Uh, I don't think it's all all received though. It might be. There's also a Yesu which is smaller than this, but it doesn't have as good of a GPS. But it is water submersible. Hey, don't knock the VX7. I got one. <laughs> um, the VX7 doesn't let you connect it to a computer. It's APRS. Oh wait, no, no. You're talking about. There's another one that's cheaper than this. That's not the VX7. VX2. Yeah, okay. VX7 has a has a G GPS on top. You break the GPS on top, and then you could, you could uh, replace your headset with a serial sort of connector, and then you're talking to the computer. Right. Um, what I was trying to talk about was the other one, the DX2. That's the little one. That's, that's the, the, the wimpy tiny one. Yes, but it's smaller, <laughs> and uh, it has GPS built in, but you can't use it as a terminal. And so it might fit your budget better. You never care. Or, or I think the really cheapest option is to get one of these things here, if you're into this, and a walk sun. Uh, recently, the Chinese have actually started putting out amateur radio gear that has actually been approved by the FCC, and it's really cheap. It's like a hundred something dollars. Uh, who sells this? Walksun.com is that the guy that sells it in the U.S.? It's one of the guys. There's several dealers. You can get it in Burbank. There's an amateur radio store actually. Brad, do you have the walks on? I have the walks on. You have the walks on. Okay. Sometimes they show up on the like stream as well. Do you like it? I like it. So, so it doesn't work near my laptop though. Where is it? <laughs> oh, this doesn't have a, It's accepting your appearance. Okay, this is the actual Chinese website. 
Oh, U.S. Okay, that's the one. Um, so this is it. It's actually I think it's a Kenwood copy. Um, so the Chinese are innovating. No, uh, <laughs> they've copied. Anyway. It actually has the same type of uh, some of the headset ports as this radio here, which is a Kenwood. So you can actually use Kenwood accessories for this because they basically copy the Kenwood design. Mm. Um, but it's cheap. Uh, where is the price? It's not near as well built as your Kenwood. Yeah, it's not well built, but as a, as a <coughs> amateur, amateur radio, the uh, 110 miles. But if you wanted to throw one of those with a tiny tracker and just throw it up on top of a mountain somewhere and have it repeat packets, uh, that's like $150. And Tie it with some twine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, $150 and 20 percent So, I mean, for those type, for doing that, you probably want to use something like this. This looks, this is ungodly big, but all this is is a uh, isolation transformer. So you connect it to your sound mode, your mo uh, sound card in your computer, and you use your computer as the sound as the mode. And the isolation transformer just makes sure you don't put RF into your computer. And your sound card doesn't have the hum on your uh, radio. So you could do cheap things like that. I mean, there are—I guess there are people that do uh, uh, search and rescue, and they might have these or his radio on their belt while they're doing search and rescue. And you could throw, make some of these repeaters cheaply if you're in the mountains. Throw, put them on top with the solar cell, and you can repeat your packets to get up the internet and you can see where your team members are. And all of this requires an amateur radio license. If you're not licensed, it's really easy. It's like a 30, I mean, how many questions? 34 questions? I don't know. Last time I took it was uh, in the late 90s, and it was 50 questions. No code. You can get the questions on the internet. Yeah. It's the exact same questions when you take the test. Yeah. <coughs> Errors are in the exact same place. The A, B, C, D, and E, F are in the same place. It's, it's all good. So it's not great at memorization. It's cake. I think there was one Ohm's law test, uh, one Ohm's law equation. Right. At, at the lowest level, it's really straightforward. You can take the test online and tell, until you're getting a passing grade, and then just go in and pay your money. If there are three levels of licensing, and if you pass the first test, you can go ahead and take the second test without paying an additional fee. If you pass the second test, you can take the third test without an additional fee. Um, if you know a little bit of electronics, you know how, how to do uh, capacitive inductive circuits, and you memorize the FCC rules, where the bands are, you can probably do all three tests in a day with, with fairly little study. I didn't, didn't study until the night before. I read the, the first two books out of the three, and I missed the, uh, the extra test, the top test, by four questions. So oh, it's, it's possible. And 70%, yeah. I think, is the passing. Yeah, it's fairly low. I think so, it might be higher than that, but it's like public school level. So where do you go to get uh, to take the license? Yeah, you can go to the ARRL's website and look up a location. Okay. Yeah, and there are a lot of testing areas around La Crescenta over in uh, Monrovia. There's a bunch bunch of people run them individually. QSL. There's a guy in Temple City that does it every month, I think. Yep, that's where I went. I think there's one. <coughs> And then the local radio clubs will sponsor a classroom, two days classroom, and on the end of the, the Sunday, you take the test. So you basically study Saturday, study Sunday, pass the test at the end of the, the weekend. When you took it, was it still paper? It was still paper, yeah. Okay. yeah. It was still paper and pen. So go to ARRL.org. I guess this is the link, right? I'll sell you books, of course. Um, getting licensed, how to do it, find a licensed class, find an exam session, that's where you go. Uh, there's a Pasadena Radio Club, which has a lot of enthusiastic members willing to help you. Tuesdays, the first Tuesday of the month, fourth Tuesday. Fourth Tuesday of the month, every month, is always a presentation like we have here about amateur radio stuff. Uh, last month it was satellite communications, which is kind of cool. Uh, for people who have satellites. And basically the guy was saying, get something like this, and you can talk to people, put good practices to a satellite. You might have to pull the time to get the, uh, the right polarization, 
Yeah. But you can talk to somebody because they're like a phone. Have you gotten any packets off the space station yet? I think I got one. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, uh, International Space Station actually has an APRS digipeter that is sometimes on. It's not always on. Apparently what happens is that the astronauts hit the, key, hit the uh, thing and turn it off or they turn it to other modes for certain reasons. Um, there's something called ARISS, which is a program of amateur radio on the ISS. Just about every astronaut is actually an amateur radio operator. Um, it's an optional part of astronaut training. And they do it so that when they're on the International Space Station, they can talk to people on Earth. So there's a schedule on one of the uh, ISS websites. 23 minutes a day, but they're not scheduled to be doing any work. Yeah, their the life is very scheduled. So <laughs> if you look at some of the forums, people are like, well, I never got you know to talk to an astronaut. And then another guy's like, they have better stuff to do, like making sure they can breathe and talk to people. <laughs> So if you can get to a link, there's some, uh, if you care to look at it, there's actually people on YouTube that have posted their conversation with the uh, ISS, and you, you don't really have to worry about Doppler shift when you're talking to the ISS over the uh, two meters, because it's not as bad. Um, but there are people that get into it a lot, into, into satellite stuff a bit, and they set up azimuth, uh, elevation azimuth type tracking systems that track the satellites, the antenna, and, or, hand, yeah. or handhelds. Well, I'm saying people go even further. They set up a base station where they have they have rotators and you know, azimuth and elevation devices, to, and they have a tracking device in their garage, <laughs> which is telling it where to move using the ephemeris program. Some people like leather. Um, some people like simple. Okay. So Pasadena Radio Club has a class once a week. But I don't think he's doing it right now, the guy that does it, because he says it burns. So it's first in September. Um, if you get license, is it 10 years? If you get license, is it 10 years? Yeah, it's like thirty-five dollars for a license for ten years. Um, it's pretty good bike. It's gone up. It's gone up. It it goes up from time to time. Sometimes it goes down. So uh, it's been too long for me. I don't remember if it cost anything at all when I did it. I think I paid six dollars. Six dollars. <laughs> what are the different levels of licenses again? Uh, technician, which only gets you access to VHF, UHF, microwave, and you know, so, um, so you could use a handheld or a mobile radio. Uh, uh, mostly FM uh, is what people use on that at the moment. So it's just like FM radio, it's just frequency modulation of the voice. Um, but if you get a general license, you can use HF, which is the more long distance communication and you have bigger antennas. So. And extra, it's extra, right? Or okay. extra, extra just gives you a little bit more sliver of the HF. Um, that is good for people that want to do DXing, which is long distance communications, because those are what DX uses, that extra sliver of the uh, band, because it's less crowded, because there's less people, and because it's under an extra. And there's not a bunch of people talking about the prostate exam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you ever listen to 80 meters, you know, at night, that's, there, there are a lot of amateurs with bad practices, so I don't encourage anyone in here to, I take, take seriously the guidelines for good practices as an amateur radio operator, because it's a privilege, not a right, um, but there is a notorious repeater, if you have a scanner, you can listen to it. The one in Burbank? W6NUT, uh, NUT. I think it's 36 no. I don't know, I changed, I It's 140 something, not 465 or whatever, but it's no hurts. It has changed hands. The one owner sold it to another guy. The FCC's closed it down. So the good thing about that is it's kind of like a honeypot. So all the bad practice people go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so people have said, so there's a long uh, thread about this repeater, and people are saying, well, if we didn't have that, it would just spread to all the other repeaters. Such as what happened when it went down, you know, a couple years ago. Those guys just started, you know, frequently other repeaters. So there are there are 
any holes in the amateur radio world like everywhere else. Um, but I encourage you to be good stewards of the radio frequency allocations that are oh, right? um, that you've been licensed for because um, the FCC won't let you know. <laughs> they won't they you could hunt you down. The other amateurs will hunt you down. Yeah, that's that's more how it is. <laughs> yeah, other amateurs. Um so oh and if you're worried about setting up an internet at your house, there's a whole series of articles and books about stealth antennas. So you don't, I bother, so you don't bother your neighbors or violate uh, CCRs or homeowners association rules. Yeah. So you can do stuff like that too. You violate it, but you just don't know you violate them. Right. They can't see the little small point per gauge magnet wires that turn your trees. Turn your charter cable to be into a. Well, that would. <laughs> you might not want to do that. Uh, you could you could use a you could use a fence as a as an antenna, but there are reasons you wouldn't want to do that because there might be loose connections that cause them to act as diodes, which are so parking fences are bad. <laughs> Any other questions? How long did it some of these look? For fun. Like, I mean, I, I think in the old CD radio days, I, I'm older than probably anybody in here, but that was horrible. I mean, the stuff you were talking about, I mean. Well, when you're an amateur radio, you don't have to do things by, like using these chintzy linear apps that, you know, they're not called linear apps. What were they called? The C linear apps. Were they linear apps? Yes. They were legal apps on yes. the CD radio. Yes, they're still linear. But okay. There's, there's another name for them, I forgot what people call them. They said stuff like 10 for a bit, but you have to go back. I mean, that's a bad practice on amateur. That's the, the amateur world wants to separate itself from CB radio. They don't kind of want to be associated with that because it has a really bad stigma. Well, you were pretty good with that. There's this one. There, yes. Got a bunch of those right. And people kind of refer to them as CB converts. Yeah. <laughs> well, my point was that I listened to some of the networks I kind of had to because I used to be a mechanic, so I had to listen to the trucks, and it, it was just awful having to listen to so People started talking about trying, idiots trying to figure out the origin of the universe. I mean, it was uh, kind of like what you said, talking about the prostate tips. So but it sounds like a um, like like anything, there's a cross section of the population represented. I mean, it's the same thing of forums on the internet. What what are the words we use for forums? Trolls. Um, you know, there are people like that everywhere. So you can't get away from that just because you have a license. Because those idiots figured it out and got a license. But those are. As your grade school teacher will tell you, there's always a few bad ones. So don't let them run your phone. Um, and you can flesh out a niche in any part of amateur radio. It doesn't have to be talking to people. You can do digital. You can do HF digital, which is mostly like a keyboard mode, which is kind of like instant message, but maybe 100 miles or 1,000 miles of RF. Um, be cool stuff. Right. How many hours do you think uh, it took you to set this up? Um, when I got stuck on some of the stuff, it started adding up. But there's a lot of help for doing uh, difficult stuff out there. And you can use a lot of the, although it doesn't look like it, you can use some of the Shiva plug information stuff because it's equivalent. So this is not a unique device. This is a rebranded Shiva plug. But if you go to that website, I, I kind of put some notes on my website. I don't know why it's still here. Oh, I can just hit ESC. Um, let's go to the So I put some notes on my website. And it kind of just has the same stuff from the presentation, but maybe it has the lines that I put into the lines to do. Or 
It's mostly just links to other websites where people have longer uh, accounts of how they got their stuff. Um, but forms and search engines are best friends. And there'll probably be another type of device like this that'll come out at some point. I mean, Marvell wants to make money, so they're going to get the manufacturers to build these type of things. And hopefully it'll be cheap. And you can, I think you can plug a USB hub into this, so if you're worried about having one USB port. And I think if you, I'd like to see if somebody do this where they actually put a USB to VGA and a keyboard and all that. <laughs> that would be sweet. For, for no other reason than See if it would work. Prove it you can. Yeah, it, it wouldn't make a good desktop at all. You're not going to be able to play YouTube. So could you use a system like that to hook up like a smartphone so you can talk through your smartphone through the internet to the radio waves? Uh, well, actually, there is an app for that. Um, there's an iPhone app for APRS, and there's also an Android app. Um, the Android one is uh, called APR, APRS Tour, written by some German guy. Apparently the Germans and the Dutch are big into this. I don't know why. It seems like the American amateurs are kind of lazy. Or... <laughs> <laughs> On original, I don't know. I think the American amateurs, there's a lot of like hardware hackers in American amateurs. Maybe. Like, Maybe, yeah. Oh, and like, for instance, there's something else called the San Bernardino Microwave Society, which they just go out into the desert and point microwave dishes at each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, they build the equipment, that's the fun part, and then they test it. But San Bernardino is a perfect place for it because you have a line of sight for miles and miles and miles. And giant military kind of like, radar that will stop on you. I mean, and those are the problem with some of the gigahertz ranges. Because um, they're, they're using really <coughs> focused beams of microwave. I know that I, somebody was talking about that, where like, occasionally you do, a guy will show up, but what are you guys doing? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll go to the Nevada cruising ground. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, you don't have to go all the way to Nevada. It's pretty much anywhere, anywhere in the desert of California. Also, no, that's that's only for people who can't read the map and you actually go onto like Port Irwin territory. Yeah, because you actually go on some of those places for rocket We 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 actually don't. We read the maps. Yeah. <laughs> you go close to those places and don't go in. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What was? So, I don't have anything else. Any other questions? Uh, anybody considering being an amateur after this talk? <laughs> no reason not to, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're afraid of multiple choices. <laughs> so, um, my dad was in the packet radio and stuff back in the 80s and early 90s. Yeah. Is it, um, and he was, he had friends who were running sort of like, <coughs> like BBSs. Okay, yeah, so that, that's another part of the history that I kind of lost over is that what people did with packet radio in the 80s was set up BBSs, like people did with modems in the 80s. And I think there are still some around, I haven't looked for them. And there's actually a UUCP type of mess, uh, bulletin network out there where they kind of, you know, have a global network of messages. Um, where they upload them daily sometimes and then download them from other PBS. I think it's sort of tied in kind of with FIDO Yeah, that's nice. Okay. So I mean, some kind of relationship. Something like that. Which is kind of, if, if we didn't have such easy internet access here, and like you didn't have in the 80s, it great, because <laughs> it was free to you know, transmit this. Or even FIDO net over modems, it was great, because you could store it and move it somewhere else. Um, so maybe this could be used in like developing countries, um, but I do. I will, I'll be the first to admit that radio is an old technology and could be improved upon. Uh, I hope somebody who is a uh, engineer that works on uh, you know 
have modulation technologies that would do something related to this? Because you could probably swing some more bandwidth out of the signal. Is the AX25 stuff stock modules now for kernel for the kernel, or do you still have to build it? Well, it depends on the distribution or whatever, but I have I didn't have to build it on the uh, GoFlex. I did have to build in legacy PTY support because they now use the Unix 98 uh, system of pseudo terminals where you talk to this one device and another one shows up, you know, another device just shows up, but not the old format, which is you talk to TTY 0, uh, PTY 0, which I needed for some of the 25 stuff because no one updated it. Um, but, I don't know, I would hope somebody would come up with, I've been scratching my head for a better use of type review. I don't know. Um, but you can, there's probably more exotic uh, modulation techniques that are out there that could squeeze more bandwidth out of, you know, the same two meter frequency. And people do stuff like that, but mostly they know for HF. Yes. And part of the problem is you, you can do it, but then who do you talk to? Because nobody else can do it. Which is a problem with these radios called D-Star, which is a... It, it, okay, D-Star is actually a new digital technique invented by ICOM. Um, it's supposedly an open standard. I think it was invented by the Japanese amateurs. Oh, the Japanese and amateurs. Adopted by ICOM. Adopted by ICOM, which is a Japanese company, which makes amateur radio. And they're just about the only company that sells you D-Star equipment. But you can build your own. There's actually some websites out there for building uh, D-Star equipment. But the problem is, there's a lot more APRS packets, uh, nodes out there, than there are D-Star repeaters. So, it's kind of chicken in the egg, you can't talk to anybody, but you, you know, yes. Did you cover uh, ballooning with APRS? Oh, no, I did not. Uh, yes, some people, you know, get like these tiny tractors. There's actually, if you go to the mailing list of the talking about the bionic stuff, there are people talking about getting one of these devices or similar, putting it on a balloon or a airplane. People like to use uh, put some of these on their model airplanes so they can find it if they lose it. Um, There's a uh, whole subculture hobby of the high altitude balloonists. They get a large mylar bag filled up with uh, you know 25% full of helium, and they put a tractor in it with APRS, let it go up to 100,000 feet, and then people from all around the country track the balloon's progress as it floats from west to east. Oh yeah, you could, you, if you knew what the uh, call sign was, you could watch it on APRS at five, which is the best, in my opinion, APRS internet website. There are others like called findu.com, and uh, you know, there's, there's another one, I forget the name of it, open APRS dot something. But this one is, I think this is also done by Dutch people, or not Dutch, or some guys in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice interface, I would say. Uh, is that FI? Oh, Finland. There you go. Duh. Will that work on uh, that transmitter? Will can you track something to the ground? Yeah. Um, certainly. Uh, I don't know if you hear when I was talking about it, but if you have one of these or one of the tiny trackers in your car, you're relying on other people to repeat your packet, either over RF or through the internet. And if you look at the map of everybody, let me stop the track. Let me stop the track. Okay, so like, here's one of the digit meters in 6 ex is a digit meter that's somewhere up here in the uh, um, So it's pretty high up. I think if you click on it, it tells you. Uh, altitude. Yeah, the altitude. Okay. Um, but, you know, if, if anybody lives up in here, somebody should put up a repeater. Because there, there's none over here. So if you go hiking in San Diego over here, you can't send out your packets. So look at the map where you should go in. Because 
because I was actually hiking up here, somewhere up here, back here. And the only person that could hear me is N6EX-4, which is somewhere out here. I could probably just put it in here. It was like a 47-mile trip. Just to <laughs> hear my packet. Oh, okay. That's amazing. So the line of sight from where I was, and I got on top of a pretty tall hill. 47 miles, that's the Mesa, just to send a packet to the internet. And I was really struggling to find the right position. Because, and you're probably wondering how I've verified that my packet's heard. Actually, I use my phone. <laughs> so you got cell signal. You got cell signal out in the middle of BFE, but you couldn't get a packet? Yeah, because uh, my point was, if you went back and look at the uh, location of the DigiPews, there's a lot more cell towers than there are DigiPews. I was occluded by hill sides from, probably this would have been the closest one, but there's a lot of hills in here, so if you're in any type of lower hill. There's like a Edison high voltage line through there. Oh, that's true, also, yeah. You made a um, so I mean, you might want to do this if you do. If if there was a denser network for hikers, it would be great because you could show your family where you are when you're hiking. But I don't think that use case is very good right now unless you bring your own computers. What you could do, you could park your truck or your car on top of the highest hill you can see on your path and set up a repeater there. And then it can hear you down here and then it can hear everybody else out there. And I think people actually do that. Um, maybe if you're baloney, you would do that. Uh, or if you use Google Apps. can't send weather reports to Google Lens, can you? You don't get Google Not Latitude into the green, though. Say again? You don't get Google Latitude into the green. Well, he did. His smartphone worked. Up to what, past Wilson? Oh, in the green? Yeah. That's such a good Well, I don't know if you can get any of your ice packets out there, you're unless you're higher than the, uh, what you can look down upon. Yeah, yeah if, you look, if you can look down upon Los Angeles, it's no problem. But if not, I don't think you can be some of the valleys as you I know, that, that's, that's sort of the point, though. I was actually considering that when we go up, you know, camping out in the uh, hills, Which the campgrounds are usually down yes. in, in little valleys and flats. You, you can get cell reception if you hike, you know, a mile up to the local hill. Here's what you do. Or you could. You bring a balloon with you. You <laughs> <laughs> tie a digipeter to it, and then... Of course, how do you feel in stuff like that? No, it's great. Back in the day, you buy
what turns out to be Ben Lott, that idiot that we just killed. It turns out he owed one of those uh, satellite companies. There was two telephone satellite companies, and they had extra bandwidth, and they had a bunch of low for uh, low orbit Earth satellites. But Orpo is still around, and somebody should give him advice and find out. I mean, if that's something you really want to do, yeah, they're still around. A lot of people go, kind of hit the kids, you know, you just got to be just build the other things, a serial port or two. Yeah, there's, there's certainly amateurs that build their own satellites. Uh, there's something called AMSAT, have you heard of that? AMSAT is amateur radios who work on the engineering and fundraising to get these satellites not put on their own rocket, but along with some other rocket. So, I mean, here's some of the satellites that are up there right now. The ISS is over there. There's amateur radio stuff on the ISS, um, like I said earlier. So you could digipeat through that, but these other ones are voice uh, satellites. And some of them had digital repeaters on them, um, but I think they died. So most of these are voice on the phone. So that's another facet of amateur radio. So the whole Antarctica has coverage, or, uh, well, for whatever, you know. It's because of the orbit. Uh, it's a lower earth orbiting satellite. And they have to do these crazy orbits. So. Um, the ISS has like a. Has anyone actually seen the ISS when it passes over? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's very easy. You go to one of these websites, you get G Predict or Predict on Linux, or you're going to have these above, and it'll actually tell you when there will be some sun lit. So it might be you know, kind of early in the evening or later in the evening when. ISIS is like coming, when I saw it, it was coming down over us. Um, so I guess the sun went, was from over here, and it was pretty brilliant. Brilliant in the sense that it was bright. And I could see it up to its, uh, high, uh, the top, you know, the apex, uh, apex what do you call it, the, uh, whatever, whatever the center, you know, when it was brought over. So it kind of just went up and it disappeared because it lost the sunlight because the Earth was occluded. Um, but that's, you don't need a license to do that, just go in your backyard. And the funny story is when I went to actually go out and look for the ISS, my neighbors were just standing out in the, the road looking at the sky at exactly the moment I was going to look for the ISS. Um, the thing's got something like a 90 minute orbit. 90 minute. Uh, Something like that. I know, like a pass over us would be like ten minutes. So there's a ten minute window usually that you can talk to the uh, astronauts. But these other satellites, I think, are slower and they last for longer. Uh, the guy, the guy at the Pasadena Radio Club said when he he was working on the satellites, he actually talked to somebody in Georgia. So the footprint was big. The prediction software was not. Said that he could have done that, but he was able to. So these are just don't believe that circle is absolute. Um, so there's a lot of amateur radio like stuff. You just have to have to get it. Or, or sorry, uh, yeah, he's not, sorry. <laughs> or I don't know, it's the. Uh, Open source. Yeah. Is he something? Anybody use open source? No. 